Lieutenant Colonel Robert W. Fett, Headquarters, Air Weather Service. Only a glance at Air Force history tells us that year by year we fly higher, faster, and farther. There was a time when all a pilot had to know about weather were the local conditions in his area. Today, weather conditions on the other side of the world can be just as important to a pilot and navigator as the weather they experience at takeoff. Global weather information over great areas is constantly supplied by satellite meteorological photography, but it is useless unless those still photographs are accurately interpreted by our Air Force meteorologists. To enhance the general understanding of this satellite photography, the Air Force presents this seminar on upper air and tropical synoptic application based to a large extent on material and techniques developed by the National Environmental Satellite Service. The Air Force meteorologists are Major Jerome Ashman and Mr. Arthur Smith of the Environmental Technical Application Center, Air Weather Service, Military Airlift Command. First, a word about satellite meteorology. We want to emphasize that satellite meteorology is not the solution to all the problems confronting the meteorologist, but is another tool in our trade. It must be used in conjunction with worldwide synoptic data. It is not a substitute for surface observations, but it certainly does give us an overall picture that aids us in the analysis of worldwide weather. In remote areas, it is frequently the first and only tool to identify severe or unusual weather. One of the cloud patterns we see frequently in satellite photographs is the spiral-shaped vortex. Vortices are easily identified in cloud photographs. The main point to emphasize with respect to vortices is that when we see dry air spiraling around a vortex reaching into the northwest quadrant, we can say that the storm has reached maturity. We can now forecast the filling of the surface low. This slide gives us an example of a mature vortex. The dry air has spiraled completely around the low. You will remember that one of the points we must emphasize is that we must identify the level of the clouds we see. This will aid us in determining the flow at that level. For example, if we look at the anvil cirrus in this picture of weather east of Florida, we can see the cloud pattern describing a cyclonic circulation. Being anvil cirrus, their tops are at approximately the 250 millibar level. We speak of high, middle, and low cloud families. Now let's look at middle clouds and examine the flow pattern at 500 millibars. Art? From our textbooks, we know that we have divergence at approximately 500 millibars between a trough and the next ridge downstream. This will result in net upward vertical motion in this area. Here between the ridge and trough, we have a region of net downward motion. These regions of upward and downward motion are reflected in the cloud patterns. They allow us to locate the ridges and troughs at approximately 500 millibars. In the region of upward motion, a funnel cloud band will be well organized while in the area of downward motion, the frontal clouds will be weak and or diffuse. A trough line at 500 millibars can be positioned from the center of the vortex just to the rear of any vorticity maximum in an open cellular field to where the frontal band weakens. Ideally, the 500 millibar ridge line is located along the leading edge of the multi-layered frontal cloud band. This is dependent upon the degree of curvature in the ridge, or in other words, 
with a sharp ridge, the clouds will terminate very close to the 500 millibar ridge line. With a broad ridge, the multi-layered clouds will extend downstream a few degrees beyond the ridge line. In this satellite picture, we can see the funnel cloud band. These clouds are strongest between the trough line here and the ridge line here. This next slide shows a ridge line where the middle clouds terminate abruptly. And in this slide, we have a picture of the 500 millibar trough being located where the middle clouds of the funnel band weaken, down in this area. Another use of defining the 500 millibar flow can be seen on the next two slides. First, we have here the typical cloud pattern associated with zonal flow. A cloud band with great east-west extent and a small north-south extent. Now, when we have sharp troughs and ridges, we have cloud bands with little east-west extent and a great north-south extent. The clouds, of course, being in the region of upward vertical motion between the trough and the ridge. This slide is a good one for summarizing the flow pattern at 500 millibars. From the middle clouds, we can identify a ridge line here, a trough line here, another ridge here, a final trough here, and another ridge line out here. Jerry? We've been talking about low and middle level cloud patterns. High level clouds are particularly important to us today because of the indications they give us of the upper air flow and because so many Air Force missions are flown near the cirrus level. Identification of a polar jet stream is often easily made from a satellite picture. This is because of the anticyclonically curved cirrus shield frequently seen equatorward of the wind maximum between the trough and the ridge at the cirrus level. It is usually accented by this shadow line on the polar side. Incidentally, the cirrus shield may be almost straight edged, but whether curved or straight, we can identify it, and we know that the jet stream lies in the clear air very near to it. There are times when we do not see the shadow from the cirrus shield. In these cases, the anticyclonically curved cirrus shield can still be identified by studying the differing textures of the cloud patterns. The high cirrus shield will usually have a smooth texture, while the lower clouds will present an uneven texture. Again, the jet stream is positioned very close to and just north of the cirrus shield. Of course, it isn't always that simple. Let's look at an idealized schematic illustrating the positioning of a polar jet stream among different cloud patterns. We want to emphasize that jet cirrus forms from the trough line to just a few degrees downstream from the ridge line. Here is the anticyclonically curved cirrus shield with its smooth texture, and here are the lower level clouds with their lumpy texture. We may or may not see a cirrus shadow on the lower features. Nevertheless, we can position the polar jet stream here. We have also found that the polar wind maximum is located above the dividing line between an open and a closed cellular cloud pattern, and this is an example. Here are the open cellular clouds, and here are the closed cellular clouds. This is the dividing line between them, and we can locate the polar jet stream above it along here. 
We must be careful, however, because we can get an anticyclonically curved cirrus shield not associated with a polar jet stream. Here we have an anticyclonically curved cirrus shield where the winds are only 20 to 40 knots. This happens when we have a high level anticyclonic outflow from a cutoff low. Notice that here we do have an anticyclonically curved cirrus shield associated with winds of 80 knots or greater. When we see this, we must be able to identify this situation. And now for another classic and beautiful weather picture. This is a Gemini picture of a subtropical jet stream. We're looking at Eastern Africa, the Red Sea, and the Arabian Peninsula. You can just see the tip of the Sinai Peninsula but a good part of the Nile River Valley and behind me. The wind maximum from west to east is located here in the clear air. This band represents a convective source at the cirrus level to the south of the wind maximum. These cloud trails grow out of the convective source perpendicular to the wind flow. They curve downstream on the maximum wind side and upstream on the minimum wind side. This pattern was originally called transverse bands, but the name was changed after an ATS movie made by Dr. Fujita showed the clouds originating from a convective source to the south of the subtropical jet. With a conventional ATS movie, we can see about an 80 knot subtropical jet stream moving from west to east over the Caribbean. You can see the cloud trails. On a close up, you get a better view of it. The subtropical jet from west to east, the cloud trails growing out of the convective source, the jet in the clear air. The picture printing process can be changed so that we have a moving coordinate system that is, we have the effect of the camera moving with an element within the jet stream. Now we can see that the cloud trails are originating within the convective source. For research purposes, we can also run the film backwards. And you can see the cloud trails growing into the convective source instead of out from it. Now with a close-up, again, you can see the cloud trails growing out of the convective source, the jet stream up here in the clear air. Here's an example of a subtropical jet stream as shown by a meteorological satellite. It extends several thousand miles. Research has shown that when cloud trails from subtropical jet streams are seen on meteorological satellite pictures, the winds will be 80 knots or greater, and the possibility of moderate to severe turbulence exists. Up to now, most of our slides have been pictures of the northern hemisphere, and that's because most of us live in this hemisphere. Satellite meteorology covers the entire planet. This is an example of a subtropical jet stream in the southern hemisphere. And as you would expect, the wind maximum is located on the poleward side of the cloud pattern. Here's another example of jet streams. In this case, we have one jet stream crossing another. This gives us a dramatic insight into the forces of the atmosphere. This is a subtropical jet stream crossing over the top of a polar jet stream. Where a situation of this sort occurs in the atmosphere, we have good reason to suspect severe turbulence in the area of the crossing. We have a transport of momentum from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. This is the subtropical jet stream with its shadow on the cirrus of the polar jet stream 
and the polar jet stream with its shadow on the lower clouds. Still working at the cirrus level, but with particular emphasis on the anvil cirrus of cumulonimbus, we can make estimates of the wind speed and direction at the cirrus level, which is near 250 millibars in the tropics. Here is a schematic of how we determine the flow at the 250 millibar level. We assume that the anvil cirrus is nearly parallel to the wind direction at that level. Anvil cirrus being advected downstream parallel to the 250 millibar wind flow. From a satellite photograph, it appears like this. This is an indication of cirrus level winds over the Indian Ocean. The winds at the 250 millibar level are approximately parallel to the orientation of the cirrus plumes. We have a sharp edge on the upwind side and a fuzzy edge on the downwind side. Using climatology, continuity, experience, and actual observations, estimates of wind speed can be made from the length of the cirrus plume. So here we have wind speeds of about 35 knots at the cirrus level. Here is another example of 250 millibar wind flow from cirrus clouds. Here we have indications of wind direction from the orientation of the anvil cirrus. And here from the clouds associated with the subtropical jet stream. So far, we haven't said anything special about infrared satellite cloud pictures. Our satellites have this capability, and what we want to point out here is that infrared satellite imagery supplies us with a 12-hour continuity during darkness. With proper calibration, infrared can give us a fairly reliable estimate of cloud height. Cloud patterns on infrared satellite cloud displays look basically the same as daytime video satellite photographs. Here are cirrus plumes shown in an infrared satellite cloud display. From this display, we can make estimates of the wind speed and direction from the cirrus plumes. Art, how accurate is the determination of wind speed and direction from cirrus clouds? In the next slide, we can give you an example of the accuracy of the winds derived from anvil cirrus. In this first picture, taken at 1951 Greenwich Mean Time, we have a line of thunderstorms extending from here up to here. In the second picture, taken about two hours later, we can see that the bases of the storms have remained almost stationary while the anvil cirrus has grown in length approximately two degrees. Two degrees in two hours, or about one degree in one hour, gives us a wind speed of some 60 knots. Thus, at this location, we have 250 millibar winds from about 240 degrees with a wind speed of about 60 knots. Jerry? One of the best applications of meteorological satellite photography is that it enables us to detect tropical storms throughout the world. Every day, we know the position of every tropical storm in the world, when and where it was born, when and where it matures, and when and where it dies. A system for classifying tropical storms from their appearance on satellite pictures has been carefully developed over the years. This involves the classification of a tropical storm in four general stages, A, B, C, and X. Stage X is subdivided into categories 2, 3, and 4. Here is a nomogram that shows the relationship 
between category, diameter, and wind speed. Stage A is basically a mass of convective activity in or near the intertropical convergence zone. Stage B is a mass of convective activity with some low-level circulation beginning to show. Stage C minus is a weak low-level cyclonic circulation. Stage C shows some low-level cyclonic circulation and some high-level cirrus outflow. Stage C plus shows well-developed low-level cyclonic circulation and a definite high-level anticyclonic outflow. With stages A, B, and C, the center of circulation, if it exists, is outside the main cloud mass, while with stage X, the center of circulation is within the overcast region. Stage X category 2 has indications of low-level cyclonic flow and high-level anticyclonic outflow with the low-level cyclonic circulation obscured by the high-level clouds. Stage X category 3 has a well-developed circulation at all levels with an indication of an irregular eye, although sometimes this eye may not be visible. Stage X, Category 4, has well-developed circulation at all levels, low-level cyclonic inflow and high-level anticyclonic outflow, and a well-developed circular eye. This is an example of a tropical storm, Stage X, Category 4, photographed by an infrared satellite sensor. In this seminar, we have presented only some of the applications of satellite meteorology, a small part of what you as meteorologists already know. The purpose of this seminar, however, is to encourage you to delve into satellite meteorology in your own seminars. We have a final thought. The study of the dynamics of our atmosphere as interpreted through satellite photography must be a constant, lifelong effort by meteorologists. This is true now, not only because we must keep alert to the hundreds of details in every cloud pattern and what they reveal, but also because satellite meteorology is a rapidly growing technology. Satellite weather pictures in the years ahead will undoubtedly reveal new telltale facts, and our Air Force meteorologists must be ready to see them, identify them, interpret them, and use them to increase the accuracy and effectiveness of our military forecasts.